our session. My name is David Olson. I'm the uh, Senior Director of Retail Support at National Co-op Grocers. For those of you who don't know, National Co-op Grocers is a cooperative for co-ops. Uh, we help pool the buying power together and apply them to business services. We also do development work. Um, and together with our 150 or so co-ops in about 38 states, we can do about $2.4 billion um, annually and serve a little over 1.3 million consumer owners. Um, so one of the ways that NCG serves its members is by um, offering experience store development support. And we do that for startups as well as established co-ops. Um, and last year, in addition to supporting several projects at existing NCG member stores, we helped uh, two co-ops, uh, two startup co-ops open their doors, um, Oshkosh Food Co-op and Fredericksburg Food Co-op. Today we're going to learn a little bit about each of these startups, and then we're going to hear from the leaders of these projects uh, who helped uh, pull everything together and kind of figure out what we learned from the opening experiences and what's needed to ensure success, specifically after opening day. So much of our attention gets focused on getting to doors open, and that's really just the beginning. And, and so really wanted to focus on opening day and the transition past opening day and sort of what we learned in that process. So joining us to speak about Fredericksburg Co-op are Chris Rowland and Dave Blackburn. Uh, Chris Rowland um, is the general manager of Fredericksburg Food Co-op. Um, in addition to leading uh, that co-op through opening, Chris managed several other stars, including Sierra Vista and Sugar Beach, is that right, in Oak Park? Sierra Vista and Sierra Vista, um, Arizona, and, and uh, Sugar Beach in Oak Park, Illinois. And Dave Blackburn is the Senior Director of Store Development at National Co-op Grocers and helped Fredericksburg and dozens of other co-ops uh, complete their expansions and open new stores in the last decade. Um, Dave is also the former general manager of Lennon Hills Co-op in Minneapolis, which is now part of uh, Twin Cities Cooperative Partners. And here to speak about Oshkosh Food Co-op are Brenda Eanes and Michelle Schrey. Um, Brenda is a, uh, the Oshkosh Food Co-op Board President. She's also the co-founder and co-owner of Blue Door Consulting, an Oshkosh-based marketing firm that she started in 2002. And Michelle Schreier is the Regional Director of Retail Support for Co-ops in the Central United States. And along with her team, uh, she and her team helped Oshkosh Food Co-op open. She's also the General Manager at People's Food Co-op in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and Rochester, Minnesota. So that's who we are. Um, we have so much to talk about in such a short amount of time today. And like I said, if left to our own devices, we could probably talk about these projects for hours, which we don't have. So we're going to jump in and get started. And I'd like to welcome Chris Rowland to come and talk a little bit about Fredericksburg Co-op. Melody, there's one here. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, everybody. It's an honor to be here. Uh, we're zooming through our stores pretty quick so we can get to the fun Q&A part. Uh, wow, but we got a handful of slides. Uh, I guess here's our overview of each of our stores <laughs> and then the panel uh, conversation where we'll talk about operating systems, GM capacity expectations, project expectations, and then the post-opening operations. Um, we did that. Me. All right, a little bit about Fredericksburg. Uh, we are an hour south of DC and an hour north of Richmond. So uh, right in the middle there, right on 95. If you've been on 95, you know enough to hate it. Uh, our major employers are Mary Washington uh, and the hospital. Um, slightly lower unemployment rate, zero population. We're small, but uh, the Fredericksburg surrounding area is something like 150,000. Uh, and our rate. So uh, a little bit about our building, uh, 10,000 total square feet, uh, about two thirds of that uh, for retail, probably too much. Um, if you ask our staff who are in our tiny back rooms, uh, we have 70 total seats uh, as far as uh, like dining seating and uh, 45 of that are outdoor patio and 25 Quick little tour of the store, I guess. We'll go back. Um, so this is our entrance, produce department. Um, it's a bulk and cooler. Uh, there's our refrigerated meat section. So beautiful. Pro produce shot. Uh, center store, boring. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, we do have beer and wine. Uh, we didn't have it at day one. It's 
dang near impossible to get it day one, but please prove me wrong. You should all try to prove me wrong. I thought I was definitely gonna have it this time. Uh, bread, our kitchen, another produce shot, bulk. Dave said I wouldn't get through all these pictures in five minutes. I said I would. Uh, here's our kitchen, um, an open kitchen concept. I guess you can see the open kitchen back here, uh, which is really cool. I don't know if the cooks like it as much, but uh, um, it's an awesome environment. It smells go throughout the store. Uh, that's our, our prepared foods manager and our juice bar menu. Uh, so this is probably all the stuff that you guys are posting about right now. Um, uh, this is our community loan, our community uh, loan fund. We got $2.4 million from our community uh, in, in loans and equity. Um, this is our pro forma. Uh, so here's the 2.4 from our owners. Uh, our big bank debt was 1.4 for NCB. Uh, kind of the interesting thing about that is uh, it's the first loan backed by the SBA, um, maybe ever, at least in decades. Um, and then here's what we spent all that money on. Million on the building, million on equipment, inventory, <coughs> working capital, obviously that's a huge one. Um, and the good news is we actually came out of this, even though we had some, a little bit of budget crisis mid-time, some uh, scary calls with Dave on the phone, uh, we actually ended up with even more working capital than that and ended up in a good place. Um, ownership growth post. I'm sure you're doing this every week or month or day if you're that excited. Uh, this is just a random one. We were at 1629. Awesome pictures of new owners. Of course, we love that. Uh, stats about our opening day. We opened on April Fool's. 4121. <laughs> <laughs> An awesome anniversary that we can celebrate over here now. Um, 13,000 in sales. You'll see Brenda's sales in a minute, and uh, her sales dwarfed our sales. We were only open half a day, um, but uh, still pretty low. Again, you know, if you remember April 1st, this was pretty hardcore in the middle of COVID. Um, you see this zero dollars in marketing. We struggled back and forth. As you may when you open, hopefully not, hopefully the worst has passed us, but uh, uh, we struggled how much to, you know, ring the bell and tell everyone to come. Uh, it was still a time when crowding and social distancing were huge. I mean, see these spots we have all over the store of, you know, stand six feet apart. Um, so we actually didn't, the only thing we did for marketing was uh, sending out an email to our owners the day before we opened. That was it. Um, owners and non-owners, so 6,000 6, or so folks on our email list. Uh, so 13,000 in sales, uh, 419 transactions. Uh, we had 1,900 something owners at opening, uh, and we got 31 new owners on opening day. First year struggles, slower sales. We're about, we ended 2021 about 15, 20% below our projections, which uh, professionals tell me is not that bad. Um, the store I opened before, Sugar Beet, opened uh, at about two-thirds of what they were supposed to. So um, there is definitely a range, and it's usually you're usually a little lower than uh, what you what you want to be at. Uh, management turnover. You know, every store is going to hire seven to nine new managers, and they're not all going to work out, including the GM sometimes. Uh, so there's always going to be some turnover, and as a new organization that's trying to train all these people on the go, um, you know, replacing folks can cause can cause extra headaches. Uh, hiring struggles, of course, we all follow the news and know uh, what's going on in, in the hiring world right now. I love this picture from McDonald's. Uh, free iPhone. With, uh, the, the small print was, I think, you gotta be there six months. Six months, you get a free iPhone. Walk does not offer iPhones. Uh, mass and COVID, of course, you know, that lowered sales makes it even harder for people to get out of their uh, patterns, their shopping patterns, their daily life. It's not a time when people want to experiment and go try something new. Um, I think when we're Fearful, we stay in our safe uh, places and we hunger down. Uh, and training, of course, uh, I'm sure we're going to talk more about that, but uh, is there enough time for training before opening day? And 
then how do you get folks trained once you're already open? Uh, especially if there's a lack of experience, quality experience, grocery experience. Uh, all right, I'll turn it over to Brenda. Uh, we are in a town of about 70,000, um, but we are, that's rounding up, but we are in uh, northeast Wisconsin, and if there weren't a giant lake in the middle, we would be a metro area of about 750,000, so we have Green Bay to Fond du Lac, we're kind of in the middle of those, um, but we're a city unto ourselves. We definitely think that way. So we're 90 minutes from here, so if you have extra time before your flight, we would love for you to come and visit us. Um, we are home to um, some major employers like Oshkosh Corporation, um, Amcor, Fort Imprint, um, lots of big kind of B2B um, employers. Um, we have an NBA G League team called the Wisconsin Herd. Really what I'm trying to do is get you to want to move there. So um, <laughs> you know Wisconsin what? Herd, we have a WGBA team called the Wisconsin Glow. We're home to the state's third largest public university, University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. And every year we have this giant festival called Air Venture, where people from around the world who are aviation enthusiasts fly in, and it brings in like 600,000 visitors. So it is like the city multiplies 10x that week, um, and it's pretty cool. And that was critical for us. We wanted to get open last year for that festival so that we could um, be open, because we know people stay in the, in the community, and we wanted to be a place where they could come and buy groceries. Um, we have super low unemployment, I mean way lower than even the, the national averages right now. Um, and we are located in a USDA designated food desert, um, so our household income is a little bit lower, and the specific neighborhood that we're located in is significantly lower. We have about 67% of people who are low income within the neighborhood that we're located in. Um, so that's a little bit about us. It took us eight years to get to open, and really, that's rounding up because the very first meeting where somebody asked a question about this idea was in 2011. So if you are on the long journey, I am here to say, it is still possible, you guys. You can do this, for sure. Um, and we have a lot of help along the way. Our major milestones, we got a $10,000 seed grant. Um, that was a, a, a grant program run through Food Co-op Initiative. That really helped give us wings. That um, allowed us to hold an event. Michelle Shry was our guest speaker. Suddenly in our community, the idea of doing a food co-op became possible. Um, in 2019, um, we identified our site. We were at that point at about, uh, we launched a site team at about 750 member owners, and then at 1,000 member owners, we announced the location of the site um, and launched a capital campaign. And yes, we completed our capital campaign. Some of you may recall being together in 2020. Um, and uh, we were in the midst of it. We had a $1.6 million capital campaign going on. Uh, and in February of 2020, we were at about 1.2 million. And you remember what happened in March of 2020. So that's a whole story unto itself. Um, we hired our general manager at the successfully completed the capital campaign, hired our general manager, built the store and opened. And this is where I'm gonna just quickly exit out of, or I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get technical assistance exiting out. I wanna show you a quick little video of our opening day and then I can, this can be our store tour, maybe. When you said that 2,000 square feet bonus, do you mean that you lease eight and you all have 10,000 square feet total? Yeah. Um, we were originally in our building design supposed to have a mezzanine and that got written out of the building design. Um, there is a, a utility line that runs through, so the building had to change from being a rectangle to a parallelogram, mezzanine no longer possible. In exchange, landlords offered us 2,000 additional square feet um, that our intent is to um, lease about 1,200 of those square feet. So, great question. Um, so 8,000 square feet, as I, we discussed, 2,000 bonus, we have about 4,800 square feet of retail space, about 1,500 square feet of shipping and receiving, a tenant space that's just adjacent to, the, to our opening and has an opening into the store. We have about a 900 square foot community room and then we have, the rest is made up of functional space. Um, we are about a $2.7 million project. 
Um, and we did kind of this unusual funding model where um, about, out of a $1.6 million capital campaign, about half was owner loans and half was charitable dollars. Um, and we did that through a fiscal agent, our community foundation, to make that possible. And then the balance was other sources. Um, and then our, just like Chris said, our you know, leasehold improvements and equipment were our biggest chunks, um, as well as then our, the working capital we brought in. So we opened last July. Um, we also were only open half a day. <laughs> um, we did a ton of marketing in advance. Um, we had um, some billboards, we did a bus wrap, we did um, lots of social and email and those kind of things. Um, we did a big opening ceremony and that was awesome. Um, we had probably, um, two, I don't know, 200 people gather in our parking lot. We did a massive texting campaign leading up to opening to invite people so, we, so everyone knew we were opening that day. We wanted people to feel like they had personally invested and we were inviting them to attend. Um, we had a very, very, very busy day for our store and this is, it was like this the whole day, this volume of people. Um, it was people waiting in line for two hours to check out. And not because our staff wasn't doing an amazing job, they were, it was just that busy, there was that much excitement. And at the ceremony, one of the coolest things was people, um, people were very, um, we invited people to speak about what the co-op meant to them and why they had supported the project. And then we had our first, the owner who was the first person to purchase a share, got to walk in first. And it was, it was really pretty cool. And we had incredible support in the weeks leading up to open from National Crop Grocers. Honestly, I don't think we would have gotten to open if it hadn't been for Michelle and Amy and the rest of the NCG team that came to help us out. So, um, I mean, we were, it was an all hands on deck kind of effort. Lots of volunteers in the store helping assemble shelves, stock shelves, clean the floor, you know, hang stuff. It, it, was, it was pretty crazy. Um, we, we did it on a really short timeline, and so we really had to be creative in terms of getting there. Um, our membership, um, we also had a really great um, uh, bump up with the opening of the store. Um, so I think we added just over 400 members last year. Um, we we um, also tracked you know, sort of where we were when COVID hit because that is such a mile marker for us. So. I would say our first year challenges, um, our sales also have been below projections. We discounted our original market study to be conservative. We discounted it by 18%. We are further below that. So one of my, one of my things that I would bequeath to you <laughs> as startups is run multiple scenarios as you're planning your pro, pro forma and run multiple scenarios as you're adopting your budget. Don't assume a best case scenario, assume a worst case scenario and stress test the heck out of stuff because that will be really important post open Systems development, our GM was hired at the end of 2020. We opened in July 2021. It was a very fast moving train and we needed a lot of help to get our systems developed and I think um, the, 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 the time window was real short and we were probably had underdeveloped systems when we opened and that's something we've now in the post open phase um, been working to get um, rectified. And you know, I, I only have the benefit of being part of one startup food co-op, Chris has three, so you may say that's always like that, Brenda. <laughs> and that's, I, that's the part I don't know, but that is an aha that we've had. And then the competitive talent market. Thankfully, we have had relative stability um, from the, um, in terms of hiring, people were really interested in learning more about the co-op than um, as an employer. So I don't think it was, we were surprised um, by the amount of people that applied. Um, so that was a positive thing. We have had though um, turnover, we uh, lost our GM at the end of October last year. Um, and then um, we had uh, an acting GM just to kind of, you know, we're still open seven days a week, so have someone in running the store. Um, that was a board member who stepped off. Then we brought in an interim GM, Kate Hirsch from Firebrand Cooperative has been our interim GM from the end of January through the end of April, uh, May. She'll be here. And we just now hired 
our GM, and we're hoping he will be here today so you can all meet him on uh, JD Gildemeister. So um, that amount of turnover, I would say, is also something to guard against. And that is my full deck. Unfortunately, we'll try and get that presented at the end. Um, but uh, thank you both for that, those summaries. I think that's really, really helpful just as a starting point. Now, when we met on the phone, we immediately started nerding out on all the stuff that you want to nerd out on. And one of the things that, um, one of the things that we, we really honed in on is there were like four categories where we felt like there was a lot of conversation to be had, especially for startups that are uh, that about to open or planning for opening. And that's the systems operation conversation that, that you had mentioned. Um, GM capacity and also expectations about what the GM can and can't do. Um, realistic programming. Um, and then uh, post-opening operations and what it's like after opening day as things sort of settle. Um, and I'll just, I'm starting off, but Michelle, you had said in one of our early conversations that um, co-ops have years to build a building but they've really got only weeks to, to build their internal operations. And that really presents a challenge for the co-ops that you've supported. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me know if you can't hear me through my mask. I'll take it off, but I prefer to keep it on. Uh, I think that what we see is uh, it's really easy to fall in love with the construction part of it. Uh, it's not as sexy to think about what are your accounting systems going to look like and who's going to write the personnel manual? Um, who's going to actually figure out uh, what a receiving uh, you know, system is going to look like and who's going to make sure that on Sunday there's a closer who you know, knows how to get the deli set up for the next day. Those are the kinds of things that uh, on opening day you actually really have to know <laughs> what those processes are going to look like. And we often see uh, co-ops who are trying to hire staff in the last two weeks prior to opening. Well, it's pretty darn tough uh, to be able to uh, not only finish developing those systems, but also train folks on those systems. Um, and, and I would also, uh, I want to slip this in because I don't know if I'll have a chance later. One of the things that we often see, ha see happen and I'd be interested in Chris's response to this, is that when managers, GMs included, but also department managers feel overwhelmed at opening, often they withdraw from the folks who can provide them the greatest support and training, um, and they hide from accountability because they feel overwhelmed. And so that's exactly the time that you need to have uh, your support and your consultants on site. Uh, often we see folks who stay you know, they're there through opening day, they may be there for a day or so after, and then they depart and your team is left to kind of fend for itself. And unfortunately, that's exactly the time that you need to be closer to the folks who can provide support. So uh, it's, a, it's a moment that I think as you're working on budgeting, um, how early can you get staff in? Uh, especially key staff who can actually learn enough to be able to train the next person who gets hired. And also, what's your plan with your su outside supporting organizations, whether it's NCG, uh, Firebrand, Kalubini, those folks really need to be close and engaged after opening day, especially that first month or so. Uh, to help people learn the muscle memory of what it takes uh, to run a business. So uh, those are those are my comments. Yeah, Chris, I'm curious, what's your experience with this? I can't hear. Well, yeah, I mean, I think NCG does a good job. They help create our pro forma. They build in lots of money for pre-opening labor. And then as your opening day gets pushed, that, that, that number starts to shrink. So yeah, you are hiring people last minute trying to train people last minute while juggling the 18 million things that there have to be done uh, to, to get the store open. So a lot of that doesn't happen. And yes, also like Michelle says, then all your pros, NCG or whoever, leave after a couple of days. And I, and I think, yeah, you're, you're there left. Uh, and now do, do managers who aren't as capable maybe retreat? That's, that's interesting, I haven't thought about that. Um, I don't know. I don't know about that. They, 
they do something. <laughs> they do something they're not supposed to do. But um, retreat could be one. I mean, I think it is very overwhelming. So I think being scared and, and maybe backing up a little bit is a natural response. Um, yeah, we got to build NTV to stay in for like two weeks somehow. Up your price, I don't know. <laughs> Um, we're realizing that it's a much cooler room than we were expecting. <laughs> um, but some folks are indicating they're having a hard time hearing, so the set that we can project as, as well as possible. That we can really come Whoa, up. Sorry. And there's a mic. And yeah, we might, we might get a little currency on closing the oh, door there. Um, there's a lot of things. I think there's a mic. Yeah, I was going to yeah, say, there's a, mic. there's a speaker behind, just on the other side of the projector. Well, you all can pass this around then. Uh, turn it on at the top. Yeah, that definitely works. <laughs> <laughs> Here, I'll let you hold that. This is how we give each other COVID. Steve, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, since you've got the money, uh, there seems to be a bit of a pinch point when it comes to establishing systems and teaching and training staff on a limited budget right beforehand. How, you've done plenty of projects. How could we, as a system, do better in this space? I think I would add, I mean, we we talked about a lot of that, yeah, other folks, and I don't want to repeat what they said, but I would, wouldn't underestimate uh, neighboring food co-ops, especially, for example, the front end. You know, if you find other food co-ops that have the same POS system that you do, um, most folks are more than willing. Send a couple experienced cashiers, uh, not only leading up to opening, but for the first few weeks afterward. It makes so much difference. In most of my experience, it's gonna be really hard for you to hire experienced staff. You may find people who've worked in retail, but not likely grocery stores. You know, and it's just a, a world of world of difference. Um, and besides all the obvious things about budgeting for it and hoping like heck that you don't open way late and, and, and use up those funds. I wouldn't underestimate the, the system. Um, you know, consultants can be expensive, uh, being one, uh, and, and, but I think counting on your peers, you know, and most of you, you know, if you have a co-op within 100 miles, they're probably willing to, uh, and it may be even worth your while uh, to consider paying their expenses. Uh, most co-ops would often be willing to cover their time, but it'd be worth it for you to have some experienced staff on hand, and not just front end, could be back end, helping you set up, because usually your back end is gonna be totally chaos and disorganized around opening. Uh, if you get some experienced hands in there, and, and then just some of that training will just happen through through setting up, so I guess I would add that. I was gonna say, do you have anything you would add in this space? Just that we did that, which and it was so very helpful. Um, I think um, Menominee Market Co-op has been our mentor co-op um, over the last several years, and our front end manager went there. And um, when our acting GM um, was put put in place, he also went. So I think we've tried to leverage that as much as possible, um, and I think that they've been very welcoming of us doing that. So I love that idea. We, we've had, we had someone from Outpost actually come and support your opening week as well. I don't know all the things, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, switching a little bit to GM capacity and expectations, that, that topic. You know, even at an established co-op, the role of the GM is extremely challenging. Um, and at a startup, GMs are expected to be, you know, strong communicators, retailing experts in every department, project managers, chaos and crisis managers, and we can go on and on. Um, Dave, clearly this isn't realistic. What skill sets do you think are most important at a startup, and, and what do you advise boards to look for in a GM candidate? Magic. <laughs> Always hire a GM who've done two other startups before. Uh, but, but it just goes to show you that even with all that experience, it's an overwhelming experience. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, you're not going to be able to hire, one of your managers may not have a ton of experience. If you're lucky, maybe half of them do. And so 
uh, I believe that the primary job early on is to open a great store and to build up your, your systems and, and your team. Uh, and hopefully once you get open, you may be able to attract some, some, some new folks that you couldn't when, oh, when you couldn't before. So I think the, the communication, uh, you've got a lot of stakeholders that have a lot invested in your opening. Uh, and after your opening, hey, this is what I expected, you know, what's going on here, why are your price is so high, uh, all kinds of things. And so I think communication and, and being a great retailer, um, you know, you, you can't do everything. You can hire some project management experience, you can hire short-term things, uh, but I think the, uh, the, the building, building of the grocery store, and you know, that's, we, we want a grocery store, uh, and I think people forget how hard it is to run a grocery store uh, in, unless you've done it, and you can't, uh, there's no substitute for, for that experience. Brenda, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like finding that candidate at Oshkosh? Um, and maybe, uh, you know, what were you looking at for at first, and, and was that the right set of things to look for in retrospect? Yeah, great question. Um, I think that when we sat where you are sitting today, one of the pieces of advice that we heard a lot was hire an experienced co-op general manager. And I do think that that's important. I would echo, though, um, some of the other comments here around Startups are different than existing stores, and the level of chaos that happens in the startup phase is, it's intense. So also looking, I think, at um, experience sort of managing that level of something like a startup, not, there aren't enough Chris's in the world yet, so if we had a cloning machine, this problem would be solved, but we don't. Not, it's hard to find someone who's done multiple startups, but I would definitely look. Um, I would definitely look at. Can you find someone who's done something that's related or similar, or can you provide support in a different way to help? Um, because developing all the things is pretty intense and, and complex, and I think in retrospect, um, you know, it's a lot to ask. Is what I would say. So just being sure that. You're, you're, you're really aware of and, uh, and thinking about everything that's gonna need to happen within the time frame, mm -hmm. and then figuring out how to support it. I think that's really critical. Uh, Chris, um, as a GM who supported multiple startups, you know, what would you advise for making the job more manageable or realistic? Or, or maybe put another way, um, what do you wish you had for support at those startup projects as a GM? Yeah, I really keep, I want NCG there two weeks after. <laughs> that would be amazing. I, I don't know why I just thought of this. <laughs> Gotta do this. Uh, I mean, Dave made a great point about reaching out to neighboring co-ops, and we did that. We had, we have three, actually we have four uh, co-ops kind of within a hundred, uh, a couple hundred miles of us, and, but they were overwhelmed too. One was going through a big project, a couple, one had just opened a huge new store, so they were all tapped. Um, we got a little support, but unfortunately, and I, I, I wasn't able to secure them kind of as long as we needed to. Um, as far as what to look for in a GM, I mean, yeah, you won't necessarily get someone who's opened a startup, but there's so many grocery store chains out there that open new branches all the time. Um, and that's a similar level of stress, I'm sure. Don probably knows better than anybody, but uh, Finding, there are people out there who've opened and been at new stores. Um, I think that level of stress is, is, is comparable. <laughs> Maybe the community and the feeling co-op part, uh, you know, can be learned. Uh, yeah, so, but, but, you know, more experts, more experience in the store, longer past opening really is kind of the main thing. If you can't get that in your staff that you hire, yeah. That's great. Uh, Michelle, what role can a board play in supplementing the GM capacity in the startup? Uh, <clears throat> this is one of those. Uh, uh, this is one of those places where I cause uh, folks who uh, are policy governance wonks um, to yeah. freak out a little bit. Uh, honestly, your board has been a working board since you know the first glimmer in the eye of uh, having a co-op in your community. 
And the reality is, is your board needs to remain a working board much longer, I think, than people will tell you. Uh, there, there is just not enough capacity on staff at opening to be able to accomplish all of the things that you've promised your community. And there's also, uh, if you've done a good job of managing your board, and I'll give a shout out to Brenda, because I think she really had one of the most skilled and talented boards that I've had a chance to work with. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of capacity there that you need to be able to tap into and to leverage, whether it's amazing marketing talent, whether it's literally someone to come in and help throw trucks uh, during store setup as you're working on finishing hiring, uh, whether it's uh, someone to help an accounting, uh, you know, with some accounting skill who can help a new bookkeeper uh, make sure that systems are going well. I think uh, being clear though about what is your board work versus what is your volunteer work in order to get the store up and running is pretty critical. And once you step into that volunteer role, you answer to the GM. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a complicated thing, but quite honestly, I don't know how you could open a startup without leveraging the, the committed expertise that you have on your board of directors. It's a complicated phase. I think there should be a lot of con a conversation before opening day about what it's gonna look like and how long it's gonna last. Uh, we don't wanna become overly codependent <laughs> where we rely on uh, those board members for those things. But I, I think we should just face the reality uh, that you can't ever have enough money in the budget to do all of the things that you need to do and that there's skill on your board that you should not leave on the table. We should absolutely leverage it. So um, that's my unpopular but very important opinion for today. <laughs> I was going to say, there's probably during that transition a cultural change that's huge that you can't even put into words, but you've got this working board and then all of a sudden you've got a business run by GM. That's it's exactly right. And it's painful. It's painful for a lot of people to take the hands off the wheel. Um, and someday Brenda will get the chance to feel what that's like. <laughs> Today, for 10 years Today. Now. <laughs> That's expiring now. <laughs> hey, Michelle, why don't you keep the mic? Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about that sort of expectation setting versus financial reality pinch that we talked about a little bit. Um, can you talk to us about the tension between member and staff expectations when it comes to a new co-op and what's realistically possible? Uh, Boy, it's tough to kind of narrow down my response to this. I think it starts during your organizing piece. I think uh, boards spend a lot of time painting a picture for the community of what the co-op could be like. And I think it's uh, you have to be really careful not to over-promise on what you can actually deliver based on the size of your co-op, You know what kind of programming you can realistically offer with the volume that you're expecting to do. Um, I think you have to spend time earlier than you think um, with experts who can help you think about, okay, this is programming that we imagine we would like to have. It's programming we've seen at other co-ops. Those folks can help you understand whether the sales volume that you have would actually support that and what it would take to do it. Um, for, for, I think, a lot of GMs uh, getting out of the gate and I'll, I'll let Chris speak to this. Uh, there is a lot of pressure to be able to look like the co-op that's been running for 40 years down the road. And the reality is it's going to take some time to get to that place. And uh, so being able to ramp up your operations uh, to understand what's most important and what's going to have the biggest customer impact as far as the experience and focusing on that and then adding in over time as you get going rather than saying okay day one everything is going to be perfect and we're going to offer every program and every opportunity uh, it's it's probably not realistic for us to be able to do that um chris do you want to add on that a little bit yeah i actually want to agree with michelle on her board point um i'm lucky enough to have an amazing board and they're not in the room, so I'm not just kissing their butt. Um, but they, uh, they've they done, post-opening, have helped tremendously with actually uh, all our events and outreach that we do. Um, uh, 
being the committee and then uh, also bringing in other volunteers and it's taken a huge weight off the store and our marketing um, and allowed us to learn how to run a good grocery store uh, while we know that huge outreach and education piece is such a big part of kind of our mission um, it's it's almost impossible to ask us to do it well at this point so I totally agree with whether it's the accounting, I've had that at a store, I've had accounting help before, I would kill to have Brenda on my board uh, in marketing. Um, There's a way to make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I sold Fredericksburg as well as you sold. <laughs> gosh, gosh, I don't think you're moving. Oh, um, no, I'm in the other way. <laughs> Average degree temperature, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think and, and Michelle makes another good point of just trying to set really realistic expectations before opening, not a month after where everything's in shambles and you're like, oh, by the way, it's gonna be in shambles for a while. Uh, before saying, you know, goal one is to have a beautiful store, learning how to sell groceries, you know, maximizing sales as we can. Um, and, and really everything else after that is kind of gravy um, until we learn how to do that really well. Um. Uh, Dave, can you talk about the, that tension when it comes to staffing for a new sh store and ensuring the successful opening? I'm wondering whether we've covered it in the previous. Just wanted to make sure that we have as much time for Q&A as possible. Again, it's reaching out to, to peer co-ops, uh, really just is bringing in people as early as you can but realizing that that's going to be a huge tension uh, as you're looking at your cash flow as you approach opening. But Brenda, any thoughts about how an organizing board can build enthusiasm without setting unrealistic expectations? Oh boy. <laughs> um, I think the, the thought that was running through my head as I was hearing you guys talk was it is particularly challenging, I think, in our in our scenario because we we located in a neighborhood that was intentionally selected um, to serve the community, and that just by its nature means we're setting an expectation of who we're going to serve and how we want to serve and what we want to be. So I think that there is an inherent challenge in if you're doing a project to meet a community need and you're talking about that, that you're setting an expectation whether whether you're remaining loose in your language or you're remaining, you know, you're trying to paint a, a picture that a, a GM can walk into and, and make successful. I do think there's a tension there that you just have to be aware of and talking to people about what success markers will look like. Um, I think that has been tricky for us, honestly, um, because some of the feedback that we got almost immediately from owners was on price image and concerns. You know, you said you were locating in this neighborhood to make healthy, fresh food accessible. Look at the prices. And so we've had to, um, we've just recently completed a full store reset um, to, you know, make more affordable options at eye level and some of those kind of things. Um, so just thinking through how you operationalize what's been promised and how you talk about if there are going to be mile markers beyond that. You know, we're um, preparing to launch a Food for All program. That will also help. But just hel helping people see that even if it's not where you ultimately intend to land, that there are action steps that they can expect. I think that's really important, too. Well, let's uh, do one more little topic and then we'll open it up to Q&A, but um, post-opening operations. Uh, Chris, we heard a little bit about what your current challenges are a year after, a year plus after opening. Um, what what was the post-opening experience at Fredericksburg like within that, that one month window? Oh man, uh, so it's kind of, you know, a lot of things that Michelle talked about. Who's closing the deli Sunday night? Who's, who's receiving uh, the truck that comes Friday at midnight. Um, really mapping out kind of the operations of the store and, and making sure that everybody knows their role. There's such a build up to opening that it feels like the finish line, really it's just the beginning. And 
getting people cemented in their roles of how this store is going to operate week in and week out. Um, and sometimes those roles aren't exactly set beforehand. You know, my my bookkeeper ended up playing a role in stocking prepared foods because it's something that she loves and it's a brand she loves and now it's a part of her weekly duty. It takes an hour, but it's an hour that the deli doesn't have to do. Um, I think you can plan for things and then once it's all on your plate, kind of reorganizing and, and making sure that everybody knows their role and is comfortable in it, and that you're making the most use out of people. Um, sometimes you don't know exactly what people's capabilities are until you see them in the middle of you know the, uh, the stress of it and you see that certain people are capable and can handle a lot more or, or vice versa. Yeah, that's great. Uh, either D Dave and or Michelle here, what, what do you see having supported many co-ops in opening? What do you think that co-ops should be paying attention to most in the, in the three months post-opening? I think M Michelle probably can talk about operations better, better than I can because often your folks are following us. Uh, but I want to harp a, a little bit on, on information, uh, especially financial information. You could actually have fantastic sales and be losing money with every sale. Uh, and it's really easy for your finance staff or the lack of a finance staff, uh, depending on your situation, to have no idea what your cost of goods are, uh, what your cash flow is, until suddenly you're bouncing checks. Um, and uh, because of lack of systems, you may not be managing your margin very well. Uh, you may have overhired for opening, which often is a good idea because who's going to work out? So your labor could be extremely high. And so having uh, the right focus so that you know how is the business doing financially so you don't get yourself in trouble and call up Christina and say, can we have some more money? <laughs> can't make that payment. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's uh, just one element that's often not thought about because you're focusing on the customer, which is absolutely your, your right focus. I, I want to twinkle at Dave's comments because uh, if you're a good manager, you need data to be able to make decisions. So uh, it's it's not just the board who wants to see that your manager should be looking at that uh, right out of the gate. I'd say one of the things that I think is really important is to not uh, have your co-op silo its staff too early. Um, it's very... Uh, a lot of people think about systems and they want to say, okay, well, we need deli people and we need cashiers and we need produce people. And in most of our startups, the volume at opening doesn't justify that kind of specialization. We really need people who are more cross-trained and who can work in multiple departments and who have multiple skill sets. I want to see GMs run in the register on, on a short day. I want to see folks who are cashiering going over and making sure produce is looking good and sweeping the floor and cleaning bathrooms. Um, that, that's the reality. I think, uh, you know, we're in a place where more startups are happening than have ever probably in the last 40 years. And a lot of folks who worked in co-ops 40 years ago, that's how we did it. Everybody was doing everything. And it's really important that we kind of uh, emphasize the, the critical nature of that. I also really want to emphasize how important it is for um, GM and leadership team uh, to understand how much is going to be demanded of them in time and energy in the first six months. You know, we should uh, plan ahead for when their first vacation is going to be so that they have something to look forward to. But we also need to understand that it's not a 40 hour a week job. Uh, it is going to probably be six days a week on many occasions. Uh, it's going to be more than eight hours a day in a lot of cases. Uh, that's a painful reality, but I think that's also a place where the board can show appreciation. Um, uh, people love gift certificates for massages or uh, date night out with their wife or whatever. It's uh, those kinds of things are really critical to show uh, concern and care. Um, boards remember your one one employee is your general manager and you want to treat that general manager in the way that you'd want the GM to be treating everyone else in the store 
and it often uh, is the case where GMs are kind of neglected as staff people. So don't don't forget those kind of things. They're really putting out a lot of time and energy for you. Make sure you take good care of them. Um, but the reality is, uh, learning is going to be ongoing for probably the first year. There's going to be a lot of churn in staff in the first year, so you're going to be retraining the same things over and over again. Um, resources are available out there to help make that process better, uh, and we would encourage you to reach out for support to make sure that you have the tools so that whoever has to be training at the moment can preserve and protect the thing about your co-op that you want to be special. One of the, I'm going to say one last thing, Dave, and then I'll, I'll shut up. But one of the things uh, we understand is that as managers turn over, if we don't have good standard operating procedures, and as we don't have good documented processes, people will reimagine those <laughs> every time you get a new manager. So every time you come in, it's a different experience for the shopper. Make sure that you're writing stuff down and preserving and protecting what you want to be special about your co-op because it has to survive kind of the, the employment environment that we're in right now where you may see multiple people in the same seat over the course of a couple of years. Brenda, <coughs> you know, what's, can you talk about the board experience post-opening at Oshkosh? Like, like, what would you recommend to boards of startups that are approaching opening about their roles after the doors are open? I, uh, I think that there's a natural inclination as a board to think we are passing this baton and now our work is done. And oh my gosh, the opposite is true. So my number one thing would be to say, uh, brace yourselves. <laughs> your role becomes more important than ever as champions of your co-op. Um, and to support the GM for sure and also to read the story, read the data. What kind of pivot do we need to make if we do? What are we talking about if things aren't where they need to be, et cetera? Um, and how, what additional support needs to be provided? So I think if you're planning to just like pass the baton and breathe that sigh of relief, I think I would, I would say kind of rethink how you can continue to support, whether that's just you know talking about how great it is, whether it's bringing friends in, whether it's you know, I'm not saying you are in the store working, but you are still working as a champion of the co-op. And so having a board that um, has energy for that and is prepared for that, I think is important. And shop. And shop. Yeah. Yes, shop. And tell, tell your friends to shop and your family members to shop. Tell them what a difference it makes. Help tell the story of what's happening. Um, we're going to open it up to questions. What questions do you have of any of our panelists here? Uh, Chris? Um, we're in the process of like, hiring a GM now just to start the report, and I'm wondering, it seems like it's a very tight labor market. And if we can't, is it, if we can't have someone who's been a co-op GM before and open a startup, is there one that's more important you think would be a better fit? Like, is it better to have someone that has startup experience and maybe not a co-op, or a co-op GM with no startup experience? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which, we, I mean, like, what skill set is more important agree. you think in the beginning? I mean, obviously, it could be either way, right? It depends yeah. on the person. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think you have a team that can prepare people for the stress of the startup. I think having co-op experience seems really valuable because you understand the scope of the job and it's a crazy scope. Um, and I think they have enough, hopefully will have enough support on site to help insulate them from all the madness that is startup. That's my one answer, but it can definitely go either way. I would, uh, <coughs> I would just uh, maybe put a twist on that and I would say more grocery management experience. Yeah, I think that the board uh, can carry the torch of the co-op side of things if we think of the co-op has got multiple entities. Um, but especially after opening, when a lot of the extra support is gone, who's going to build your, your system? Who's going to build the, the store culture? Who's going to build that, that great staff that's really going to uh, take care of everybody? And if your GM doesn't have that experience, then they're going to have to either bring in, continue to bring in consultants or I'm not sure what. Because odds are you will not get somebody who's 
worked at a co-op. I mean, I would say. Speak up. Okay. I would say it's odds are you're not going to get somebody who's worked at a co-op. Mm -hmm. So Dave is right on with grocery experience being yeah. huge. And definitely also look at just like the the relationship that you're going to have with that person and their <laughs> understanding of the overall vision and what what will be operationalized and ideas for doing that, I think is also really important to make sure that you have that alignment um, going in. Um, skills can be learned, cultural fit and um, shared, shared understanding, that's a little tougher. So I think there's importance there to make sure that the person is coming into an, a, a, an environment that they, they, you know, they're passionate about. So what just occurred to me, one of the things that's happened because of the shortage of GMs happening today, as we see a lot of boards seeing grocery or co-op experience on the resume and getting really excited without actually asking, oh, this person was only at the job for two years, what happened? So do your background checks, do your call up previous employers, get a sense of who they were, um, because it's very easy to, to just bring in the first person who looks great. Don't shoot me for this question. No, but <laughs> why does an NCG have a program? Yes. For these these managers because there is a demand in I just started coming to these conferences, but I play I heard this like two, three years ago, so there's a huge demand. People don't have the experience and you guys know the road. So I mean that there should be people who have been in my opinion trained to an NCG standard, um, uh, interned in these stores, which we give everybody else some help, and we have a pool to draw from, instead of hoping, wishing, and praying somebody gets it. <laughs> 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 yeah. Nobody up here is going to disagree with that. And the, re the reality is, is that the really great management training programs that are out there are at at organizations that work ours, right? Like, like even us with with our with the the 150 costs we work with, we cannot reproduce what a Kroger does. But we do have a lot of training materials. We're building that out continuously, and we're focusing a lot more on the post opening training concept, mm -hmm. ensuring that there's a lot more staff attention to co ops post opening to help them through that. And, and I would like to think that, you know, hopefully we will get to a place where we can have a more comprehensive program. We all agree with you. We see the same problem. Too many food business. We need it. I understand. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have a thought about criteria that you look for in a hire for a GM, and I'd love to know you guys', I guess, reaction to this. Um, as, you know, you talk about co-op experience, and then the pool gets, and then you talk about, and, and then you look at where you're located, and no GM wants to come to Central Illinois because what a yawn, and, and you know, all the things. So, in, in what I have learned through our inordinate number of hires, um, is that leadership skills, regardless of the industry, Lead, somebody who's got leadership skills, you can't teach that. That's almost like a personality trait. If they can see good people and learn how to build them up and, and be a leader, you can teach them grocery. You can get them a mentor. You can get NCG materials. But you can't teach them to be a good leader. They will cave under pressure. They will, you know, demoralize your staff. Um, that's what, as you know, looking at the landscape of who's available to try and find those individuals, even if they come from a whole different industry, they're willing to give it a go in grocery. That seems like a, I don't know, it seems like a wise way to go about this lack of manpower in this industry. And, I, and I'd love to know what you guys think about that notion of, you know what, sure, co-op if you can, grocery if you can, but our grocery candidates came from Kroger where everything's handed to them and they really don't know how to make a decision. So we've just gone through the hiring process again and that was one of the things, so our new GM has worked extensively in food and beverage, but not specifically in grocery, and is, is learning that, but has managed um, restaurants, um, catering, concessions, food service, um, those kind of things, and that is the, the direction that we, we went. Um, and we're, we, we looked at, um, there's a lot of support around uh, uh, and training. Um, this, when you meet him, you'll see he has a real passion for this for this issue and this 
uh, idea, and and that is, you know, I, I think uh, uh, we saw more candidates. Um, we saw that there were few candidates um, overall in our pools, and we knew that when we went into it, we, we may need to look at candidates with different backgrounds for that exact reason. And you're spot on that when we talked with folks, and I'm not saying this is right, wrong, or indifferent, but when we talked with folks, there is a difference between being a general manager of a grocery store, of a co-op, and being a manager of another store. The level of what you're responsible for, the P&L level responsibility, is the particular differentiator, I think, um, as well as like marketing, membership, board management. There are some really unique things that we're being, we're asking our leaders to do that don't need to happen in a large chain organization and I think we just need to be cognizant of that that's not to say those skills can't be learned they certainly can but it is a reality to consider as you're looking at candidates what are those most critical things that you're going to need in that person um, and do they have those those skills not just being experienced being in a store if that makes sense yeah I would also agree just with Melanie in that leadership skills even if it's not in grocery, are what's important. Grocery is not rocket science, and uh, if you can just find somebody with those, who's a leader and who's gonna help build that staff up, anybody can learn grocery, I would say. So I have a question. Um, with regards to kind of opening day, because I'm just kind of seeing it in my we're slated to open, hopefully this year, if not. Uh, we're, we're slated to open what store? this year. Uh, Wild Onion. Okay, oh. awesome. Yeah. Um, so, I am kind of nervous about that opening day because you kind of say that and, you know, let's say the GM doesn't necessarily have experience with opening a, a you know, a co-op, a startup from scratch. What are some of the things, and it sounds like, uh, it sounds like NTG may have some resources, consultants, and people to help ease that burden because I, I hear that and I just kind of go, that sounds, I hate to use the word, it sounds like a nightmare for the first couple of weeks, but it sounds like unless you have people that have both opened a store at the GM level and people that have grocery experience and opening a store, it just sounds like a very long process that does not sound fun. So uh, that, that may sound to me, some people have their own ideas of fun. Um, but what are some of the, I guess, in this instance, consultants or, or opportunities for us to get some help if we need it? Because it sounds like we might, it sounds to me, I, I think we might need it. <laughs> None of us have opened a grocery store, we haven't found our GM, da, 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 da. So uh, one of the things I really want, was hoping I would get a chance to say today, uh, you just stepped right into. So thank you. Um, the, one of the things I would really encourage you to do is to not expect your general manager to run the construction project. Hire an owner's rep, someone who is experienced with managing construction and managing contractors. Um, someone local who can be on site as often as possible. Um, I've seen just horrendous decisions being made by people who were not qualified or experienced, and those have long-term ramifications for your co-op. So, uh, you know, if you don't have that that uh, experience on your board, please hire it because it's it's really crucial and it's also a great distraction. People love to build stuff because uh, you can tangibly see the results. Uh, but it's a distraction from all of the systems and the training work that need to happen uh, for your staff. So that's step one. Uh, step two, I would say uh, if you're considering NCG membership, uh, that's how you get my support uh, is NCG membership. And in some ways, I think with our experience with Oshkosh is that we came into the project later than we would like to. They used other consultants to uh, do store planning and to do construction kind of management. So we were kind of coming in at the end and trying to figure out what their programs were supposed to be and how we were going to help them figure out how to run them. We'd, we'd love to get in a little bit earlier than that. Um, but if you're considering membership, I would encourage you to consider it early and not wait until you're open. Um, uh, as far as 
uh, outside consultants, there's a lot of great folks out there, but I just like when you're hiring a GM, check references. You know, find out what the strengths and weaknesses of those consultants are as well, because there is a fairly small pool of folks who work specifically with food co-ops. There are lots of folks who work in other kinds of grocery or uh, industry as well who could be sometimes even more helpful. Uh, no, no bad juju for uh, the folks who work specifically with co-ops, but there are more people out there and available. Uh, so don't, don't hesitate to expand your, your reach uh, when looking for support. Um, I, there's a, so, uh, yes, you had a question earlier, I'm sure we got um, I don't know if you can hear me back there, but um, I'm with the Kingston Food Co-op, and uh, we're about conservatively two-ish years away from opening, and um, and so accordingly, we were looking to hire our GM, and we did a GM search, and then we decided to take it down, um, because we really want the co-op to be a place of like, you know, where the marginalized community members who are really struggling with food can access it. And a big question for us was how do we create that environment? And that is looking out to the leaders, you know, who are in these communities and supporting them over the next two years. But further, and this is what I want your thought on, um, we were thinking about um, given the expectations of the GM role and how some things can be specialized uh, to break apart. Um, instead, working with a group of four to six folks from marginalized communities, supporting them over the next two years, and employing like a shared leadership model in place of a GM model. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> we, we have folks in our membership who have collective management. Um, you know, not a lot, but there's a few of them who do. Uh, I think uh, having people who can share not just authority but responsibility is pretty critical. Um, really someone has to be responsible. If things are not going well, uh, how are, how are re resolutions going to come to those challenging environments? And if someone isn't pulling their load, you know, is there a good process to ensure that you can either get them up to speed or find someone who can uh, replace them, who can bring what talent you need to the team? without overly expanding, you know, the team. I think uh, controlling personnel costs has been probably the biggest struggle I've seen inside of our co-ops, not just startups. I'm talking co-ops that have been around for 50 years who are really struggling with the discipline around that, and those things are pretty crucial. Um, you know, I think that the world is changing around food and justice, and I think we need to try lots of different models and systems. We have a lot of experience with one model. Um, but I personally would say uh, I'm open uh, to working and supporting with folks who want to try different models. We, we recognize in the past a lot of those models failed, and so we would encourage you to study those folks and figure out what were the things that caused them to fail so that you can try to avoid those challenges. I'm all for the innovation, so I, I like that. Um, I'll actually put on a different hat in answering this question because in my real life, I co-own a business. Um, and so I've had a business partner for 20 years and I can say that um, it's beneficial to have multiple minds looking at issues and it also requires, um, it also can move slower because multiple people are looking at, at issues. And in a startup, lots of decisions are being made um, and relatively quickly. So I think what Michelle said is spot on in terms of thinking through in advance how the, how the structure can support what the needs of the business will be. I think that's really critical. Um, there's some, there are some good like books out there on how to build successful partnerships, and I, there may be some I'm just not familiar with um, even broader than that. I think outlining the accountability side, the, how are we going to navigate if there are um, challenges or disagreements, you know, what is our process for resolving that, I think thinking through some of those things in advance and building the structure, I, think, I, I don't think there's a reason it couldn't work. But I will tell you from personal experience that it does add a level of um, personal dynamics that you need to account for in the process. So if that if that helps, but I love the innovation. We've got about 
two minutes left. Oh, should we, should we take maybe one more question? And then um, I know folks will be hanging out here, by the way, if you want to just come up and ask us. We're happy to spend some time answering questions afterwards. But maybe one more question, and then we'll let folks who need to get on to the next session go. Um, uh, how about, yeah. I was just curious about NCG membership because I didn't think it was that easy for startups at a certain sales volume to get the services that are available to those people who are members of NCG. Yeah, our um, NCG's board of directors just recently um, changed our membership criteria to um, to and and effectively eliminated what had been a two million dollar sales threshold. Now, there's some things that we still have that we look for in the application process. And, but the, the sales threshold was always meant to get past this problem that was specific to this, the, the lower your sales threshold, the harder the job is for the GM. Like just, just in fact, it, two million is, is really, the, there's a point at like four, four and a half million where a co-op can start to begin to hire folks like a professional HR person, you know, a full-time accounting person, and that takes some of the pressure off the GM. Um, but I think what's more important to us, and I'll let Dave and, and Michelle answer this separately, is is the co-op committed, if they're small, are they committed to growing and expanding? Because one of the things that we often see in some startup projects is, well, you know, we actually, we, we want to keep this kind of exclusive, right? Like, we, we, we have our core membership and we love them and, and we're really focused on that and growth is just, some people, you know, just even don't like the word growth understanding that it's not growth for growth's sake, it's growth to be able to be able to hire the staff that you need and pay them what they need to get paid and do all the other things that go into being a co-op. So um, we've got, we're a lot more flexible in our in our membership criteria now. There's still an application process and co-ops still have to provide materials and we review those pretty closely, but that $2 million threshold is not there. I, I would also pitch out, we have limited capacity also. Um, you know, the amount of time that it took us to support one startup, uh, you know, it essentially took my team offline for the other hundred, you know, we, had, we support 54 other co-ops in our region uh, that are already members. It, it really is, we probably can handle maybe one or two a year uh, in our corridor and, and you know, that, that, that's a squeeze that's creating a lot of, a lot of pressure. It, it, it's, it's, it's just really hard. You all know this. Nobody needs to tell you. It's really hard. Um, oh, well, speak a little bit for the. Oh, okay. One more question. I just how how long does MTG consider the startup phase? Uh, In terms of support, what you're talking about, Vicky. Really uh, how long does MTG consider the startup phase? Yeah. Yeah. What is what is the duration of the startup phase? How early do you want to start working with someone before they open? Ideally. When do you want to first engage with a startup? Yeah. Oh, um, like how far out? Yeah. Well, we found the, the most success is if we start working with you, like before you sign a lease. We've seen people We've get really excited about the sign up. And, you know, right? And, and either, no, let's say you yeah. sign the lease. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you say that because we work with folks after they've signed the lease. Understood. Uh, and there are problems with the site that have to, you know, really challenge the co-op, or there may be uh, problems with the lease that can be, you know, you, you have 20-year problems or 10-year problems. It's not like other contracts you have that you could uh, get out of. So uh, I say at this point, we meet you where you are. We kind of think of, you know, you're going down the river, we're jumping in the river. Hopefully, we have flotation devices. Um, but wherever you are, let's have a conversation. Let's see how we're going to do it. All right. Quick clarification. That's projected sales. Correct. Those leases. Projected sales, not actual For two, for the two million dollars. I'm going to be Oh yeah, yeah. It's not. We don't. We don't have a sales threshold anymore. Okay. okay. But it's gone. Okay. Yeah. So we do want to see the. We do want to see your performance. Huh? Uh, okay. Make sure that the assumptions are real secure. Yeah. We, we don't really have the same sort of rigidity around the volume. Okay, thank you. We love talking about this stuff. Please, we want you to be able to get on to your next session. But uh, thank you for coming and seeing us. And